And yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Good afternoon again. And my plan today is go through Einstein equations and uh, and finally touch on the weak field limit. Um, I want to say a couple of things. It, it's, it's been very difficult to me to make a decision as to what to cover, what not to cover in things, uh, particularly like this, uh, that is not touching on any current aspect of research. It's, it's all well known and developed over the last hundred years. And, uh, and for probably most of you, doesn't have much interest because you know better than me. Um, but there are many things involved, and, um, and the machinery that is needed to um, go into gravitational wave detection is quite impressive. If you think in terms of the theory, um, it's not just why we're using uh, this way of studying uh, gravitational waves, but, uh, but it's a particularly very complicated problem. And that's the reason why numerical relativity is so important. And I'm not going to be talking about numerical relativity. I don't think anybody's going to be talking about numerical relativity. And in my mind, it's becoming one of the most interesting problems now that finally gravitational waves have been detected. So in order to do those things, I'm probably going to mention a few things that are somehow important for the theory of gravitational waves, although we won't have much time to use it. For example, introducing the wild tensor at some point because it's very important to, uh, when you do gravitational radiation, uh, to, to use the, the wild tensor. So I'm going to do a couple of things like that, uh, although I, I won't be using them too much. Um, but I think they're important. And probably if I have some time, I want to touch upon the history of gravitational wave detection because that's the one thing I find truly fascinating. And uh, so, oh, I need to turn it on. And so going into the weak field limit and why the weak field limit is a good and valid limit uh, for general relativity, I think it's important to look at, uh, at the, ba the five basic principles that uh, guided Einstein. One was the Max principle. I'm going to describe in what, what aspect of Max ideas, Ernst Max ideas, uh, who was a physicist from the end of the 19th century, uh, were crucial. The principle of equivalence, the principle of covariance, the principle of minimal gravitational coupling, and the correspondence principle. So regarding Max principle, Einstein called it a principle for the first time, and it was essentially referring to uh, and this quote from uh, Max. The investigator must feel the need of knowledge of the immediate connections of the masses of the universe. Um, there will hover before him as an ideal insight in the principles of the whole matter, from which accelerated inertia motions will result in the same way. So what, what Max was trying to do before Einstein was to get rid of the idea of an absolute space. And, um, and obviously, uh, a very important aspect of, uh, you know, to get towards the development of, or to the demise of the idea of an absolute space is uh, the understanding of what is the meaning, intrinsic meaning of non inertial frames. So inertial frames, we already saw, everybody knows, are really uh, reference systems in absolute space. Now, what is the intrinsic nature of non-inertial frames? So forces that appear in non-inertial frames are called inertial forces. So for example, if you have uh, like a bucket here that is rotating, uh, you're going to see uh, uh, a concave uh, arrangement of, of the fluid in, inside the bucket. And of course, it's related to what we call uh, the, the centrifugal force. 
and, uh, or if you have the same bucket being accelerated in a given direction, then you're going to see something like this. Are these forces fictitious? What is the origin of those forces? And um, so in some sense, the idea behind this is this type of systems can help us determine uh, when a system is inertial. So for Mach, the existence of the masses in the universe, which are, if you want to put it, you know, everything that is beyond the Earth, uh, will determine a local inertial frame. In, in some sense, it's a privileged state of motion uh, respect to the stars, and um, the inertial forces are related somehow to the matter of which the stars are made of. If you look at a pendulum in the North Pole, uh, well, for Newton, it's a non-rotating frame, but of course, an observer is going to see the pendulum swinging 360 degrees in one day exactly. So um, what we get then as a conclusion from Max principle is that inertial frames are those in which the fixed stars are non-rotating. But um, if somehow there was an, an isotropy in the distribution of matter in the universe, this would change the landscape uh, in, to which Max was referring. And um, so inertia of forces would show then some lack of isotropy, like in the bucket experiment. So uh, first experiments in the early 60s, Hughes and Drever uh, trying to determine if there was any anisotropy, and they got no results. And no results went all the way up to, um, you know, even in the 2000s. So. The summary of all these uh, Machian ideas and in, in all this way of discussing general relativity and following uh, Ray Inverno's old book, which I personally like it at, at some point, at least for certain things because of the discussion he makes. So the matter distribution determines geometry. If there is no matter, there is no geometry. Um, in a body, in an empty universe, you have non inertial properties. So this is essentially what uh, what Einstein was thinking about. So, uh, in principle, we could uh, differentiate between inertial and gravitational mass, but also we could have uh, differentiated with passive and active gravitational mass. Well, you can form as many experiments as you want, and, and nothing can show that there is any difference uh, in, in all these um, ways of referring to, to mass. So, it is in this regard then, then going to the principle of equivalence. Uh, the motion of the gravitation at this particle in the gravitational field is independent of its mass and its composition. The gravitational field is coupled to everything. There are no local experiments which can distinguish non-rotating free fall in the gravitational field from uniform motion in space in the absence of gravitational field. So Einstein's uh, happy idea. And a frame that is linearly accelerated relative to an inertial frame in a special relativity is locally identical to a frame at rest in a gravitational field. So <coughs> this can be formulated mathematically, thinking in terms of Minkowski space. This particle uh, is, is going to follow the geodesic of a space time, which are straight lines. So essentially, one is going to be the equation. In a non inertial system of reference, then we're going to have. Uh, forces uh, coming into play, and we got the full um, geodesic equation. And uh, if we want to think of this as force terms, then the metric has to be seen as potentials. Because remember, we calculate these crystal symbols or connection coefficients, as mathematicians call them, from the metric. And generalizing this to build a relativistic theory of gravitation. So Einstein proposed this, a principle of general relativity. All of service are equivalent. In a special relativity, we have preferred system, Minkowski coordinates. In a general curve space time, we don't have a preferred coordinate system, although there's symmetry. Um, in the principle of general covariance, the equation of physics should have tensorial form. What this means is the theory should be invariant and the coordinate transformation. Now, the other principle I mentioned was the 
principle of minimal gravitational coupling. So the idea is the following. If we look uh, a simple conservation principles, the divergence of the matter content um, in the absence of, uh, or in an isolated system of reference, it's given by this equation. So the simplest generalization now, going from spatial relativity to general relativity, is thinking that all the matter that is contained in this quantity called the stretch uh, energy tensor, um, it's going to be this law where now this is a covariant derivative and introduces the possible curvature of a space time. Now, this is very clearly connected to this other idea, though, principal conservation of matter, if, if you want, in, when the system is isolated. But we could have taken this other way of uh, coupling the geometry to the, to the conservation law. Remember, the geometry comes here because this is a covariant derivative. But it can come here through the Riemann tensor that we know is a very important quantity describing the geometry of a space time. But if we follow the principle that says no terms that contain the curvature tensor should be added when making the transition. So the idea is to make the coupling minimum. And, and, and actually, Einstein, in developing the theory, experimented with possible different formulations. The correspondence principle essentially is that from general relativity, you should obtain a special relativity when, uh, when there is no matter content. It should have, as a limit, Newtonian three-year gravitation. So essentially, a Newtonian mechanics without gravitation is still part of the theory in a limit. So, <coughs> one way of, of saying this, and the reason why I introduced this calculation is to, to make the idea of the weak field limit uh, a valid idea. So, let's say that we have uh, a, a metric that represents Cartesian space-time, uh, or just the space part of, the, of, the, of a Minkowski, although we're not going to use Minkowski because we, we want to use just pure Newtonian physics, but it's still look an equation that describes the deviations of geodesics in, uh, in Newtonian physics. So we look at the path of two neighboring particles that are acted upon by a gravitational field, and so one goes through the point P, the other through the point Q, so C1 and C2 are the different paths, and this is a connecting vector between the two paths. Now, if we have a particle traveling on C, then Equations is, are very simple. This, this is an equation for, for the curve, for the path. And for the other one, it's very simply uh, given by this, where this is just a vector that essentially from this one is giving me the uh, points along C2. So the equations of motion are going to be given by the second time derivative of the position at this point, and for the second one, are going to be similarly be given by this. And if we do a Taylor, a Taylor uh, series expansion, then uh, we can get this is the first order. It's going to be the second order, second derivative. If we do a subtraction, then this is the equation. And we can define this quantity that, if you notice, is essentially the Laplacian of the scalar field. <coughs> then the Newtonian equation of deviation can be written like this. And uh, so we can compare now this equation with this other equation that is the equation that was precisely describing the deviation of geodesics and depends crucially on the curvature of the space time through the Riemann tensor. So, well, this is the same equation. And in our case, um, Zeta is eta, and the vector v here is the vector x that define the first curve. And um, so, conclusion. What is the equivalent of having the Laplacian of phi of the potential equal to zero in the Newtonian theory? Well, we're going to need to find uh, a reference frame, what is called a, a tetrad. We can do it um, this way, and of course, we, we want the system of reference to be orthogonal. Uh, 
and, and essentially this is going to be constructed with the Minkowski metric. And we can define a connecting vector now with this uh, spatial uh, component, and then the analogous equation for Newtonian deviation is going to be written in these terms, and we're actually, um, if we contract this kappa, uh, k, k, sorry, uh, term that was related to the uh, Laplacian of the potential is, is equal to this. So comparing these two results, we see that essentially this is analogous to requiring that the trace of the Riemann tensor uh, vanishes, which is this equation. And if we look at the meaning of using this, this essentially reduces to these components in the Riemann tensor, uh, only one through three, so the space components. And due to the anti-symmetry, then we're going to have uh, this expression for this component of the Riemann tensor. We can combine in this way. We can write it, uh, then the components in this way. And this is going to mean that the Ricci tensor is going to be zero, but this is equivalent to the vanishing of the Einstein tensor. This is actually what Einstein worked to relate um, the Einstein tensor to the metric and, uh, and to the, the Newtonian potential, because he wanted to obtain in the limit, New Newton theory of gravity, and because for slow motion, uh, we we know it's the, the correct theory. So these are the equations that Einstein proposed to serve as the vacuum field equations in general relativity. Now, the full field equations. Uh, I mentioned that this is the conservation law that we want to respect. We can generalize this to this, but that means that also the covariant derivative. Uh, is, well, sorry, this doesn't mean this, but we know because of identities that the Einstein tensor satisfies that this is also true for the Einstein tensor. So this shows a connection between the two quantities. And uh, so the idea then is to make them proportional and uh, making it proportional so that in the weak field limit you obtain Newton theory, the full GR equations are this. Mm? The Einstein tensor proportional to the energy matter content of space-time. So we finally got Einstein's equations, and now we're going to go into the weak field limit. So I'm going to follow here something that those of you might have already seen it in, in book and uh, Schutz's book on introduction to general relativity, which is now probably, what, 20, 30 years old but it's, it's still a pretty good book to, to, to follow these things. And um, so we can work with a metric that is of this shape. Notice that except for this parenthesis, this is essentially the Minkowski metric. In other words, if the potential is zero, this is the Minkowski metric. So it's departing very little. And we do expect that this phi, at least far from the source, it's going to behave like the potential, the Newtonian potential. In all this, we can assume that, uh, you know, the, 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 the potential is much smaller than, than the mass. So, so we are really in, in, in a weak field limit. And um, we can compute the motion of a freely falling particle. Uh, you know, the momentum is given by this, where this is the velocity, and then it's going to... Uh, uh, follow this equation, which is essentially the geodesic equation. So if the proper time tau is an affine parameter along the geodesic, of course, this, if I divide by the mass, it's still going to be, and this equation can be written, it's essentially very simple to prove this is the same equation. And this equation is also good for plotting. So this is momentum conservation in, uh, in the weak field limit. If we look at the zero component of that equation, we can write it this way. If the particles moving with a velocity is much smaller than c, essentially these are, are the terms that survive. Uh, we can take the other uh, zero to second order, and then we get that the, this term of the connection for the zero, zero, zero component 
is equal to the time derivative of the potential plus uh, orders of the potential squared. And we're going to get that the time derivative of the, of the zero component of the momentum is given by, by this. And uh, space components can be written like this. And uh, we get this other equation, which can be written in, in, in these terms. And this is just uh, the metric, uh, the space components of the metric, uh, one for i equal to j and otherwise 0. The geodesic equation then can be written like this. And one step further, we can write it like this. And we can write this in terms of the metric now. So if all the components of the metric are independent of the coordinates, then this quantity, uh, the beta component of momentum, is constant along the particle's trajectory. So we get automatically a conservation law. And if the metric does not depend on time, we can, have it, uh, we can find a coordinate system which the metric components are time independent, P0 will be conserved, and this is the energy. If we apply the metric to the definition of momentum, well, we get these quantities, and we can solve for the zero component of the momentum, which we get this. And uh, we, of course, still assume that the, the field is, is, is weak, small. And, uh, and the, zero, uh, the square of the zero component of the momentum is going to be given by this quantity. Lower the index a little bit more, and we can see that the zero component is essentially half is equal to the rest mass plus the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. So this is good. We obtain special relativity and results that were very important in special relativity. Um, one comment here, general gravitational field is not going to be stationary in any frame, and this means that we cannot define a globally conserved energy. This was one, uh, probably the worst nightmare in the history of the development of theory of gravitational radiation. The, the impossibility of defined energy in, 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 a, in, a, in a very clear, covariant way. So looking at the result of the metric being actually symmetric, we can define equivalent. Uh, this is probably a bit boring, so I want to brush through it. Um, the uh, angular component of the momentum, if we have an angular velocity, is going to be given by this, which is a conserved quantity. So angular momentum is conserved. So now, in order to do a treatment of the weak field limit, uh, we're going to be working with a set of coordinates. One of the biggest problems in general relativity is the intrinsic meaning of coordinates. And in a typical course in general relativity, um, there, there are discussions about this because you can see something in front of your eyes, you believe it's something, and it's actually something else. How do you know that this is not a particular way or disguise, that disguise is behind um, some coordinates? Um, what, is, what is the intrinsic meaning of the space time that you're looking at? And um, it, it, there were different efforts to characterize this in a meaningful way, and, uh, and of course, this is beyond the, the scope of this short course. But I want to emphasize that it's an important point. So in order to study certain problems, you need to adapt your coordinates and try to understand very well what they mean. And eventually, when we look into a um, particular set of coordinates where it's easy to understand the meaning of gravitational waves in the weak field limit, it's, it's going to become something very important. <laughs> <coughs> so, in an arbitrary space time, not necessarily homogeneous or isotropic, we can pick an initial space like surface, put there an arbitrary coordinate grid, look at the geodesic well lines orthogonal to it, and attach to them coordinates x1, x2, x3, constant, and take x0, the, the time component of, of the coordinate system, equal to t, equal to a given value plus a tau, where tau is the proper time along the world line. So it's such that tau at this hypersurfaces that we're looking at is equal to zero. Now, if we have a general metric, uh, 
then since xj is constant along the geodesic, then ds squared can be written like this along the geodesic. So it simplifies the way we can write the metric in a particular region of a space time. So along the geodesics also, we know that uh, ds is minus d tau squared. So essentially, it's going to make g0, 0, 0, minus 1 everywhere. And that's useful. So now, if we take E0 to be the coordinate basis vectors and let U be the derivative respect to tau, uh, it's, it's a tangent vector field to the geodesics. That's the reason we're using the tau, the parameter along the geodesics. Um, for example, U is a 0. But by construction, we have a, a tau 0 that U is scalar, uh, scalar product with EI, so the other uh, uh, elements of the base we're going to have G0i equal to 0. So notice uh, this is important. And essentially, the total derivative of this quantity um, along the um, along the geodesic is going to give me uh, this 0 plus u, uh, a scalar drop with the gradient of u uh, along the geodesic. So the curves are geodesics that are going to uh, behave like this. And uh, EI and U form a coordinate basis, EI U equal to zero. And because this is also zero, we get that U scalar EI is zero everywhere. And then the metric can be written in this way, which is called synchronous path. Nothing in front of the DT. Uh, probably to avoid further interruptions, I'm going to turn this off. And that should stop annoying. And <coughs> so, this is important. This provides a way of working in what is described as a weak field limit. So, um, a way of checking if this uh, approximation works is to use what is called the low speed limit, uh, because we know what we should obtain in the low speed limit. And so far away from a source, the gravitational field should be weak, and then the metric can be written in this way. So this is a generic metric. Far from the source, we're going to write it like Minkowski plus some small quantity. See, each of these, of the components of this perturbation metric are smaller than one. And, uh, and by writing this, we, we're saying that we're going to find the coordinates in which this equation is possible. And if this equation is true in one of the systems, then uh, it's going to be true everywhere. So, again, how we choose coordinates is very important. So, let me work now with the Lorentz transformations with these uh, equations. So, this is um, the gamma factor that contain. I'm using this, although I didn't say in any slide, C to be 1. So the speed of light is taken to be 1, like theories typically do. And um, so the Lorentz transformation can be written this way. Uh, and the Lorentz transformation is going to be given changing from one coordinate to the other through this uh, metric. And uh, so if we transform, Lorentz transform the metric, so just multiply our metric by this. Um, we're going to get these two terms because one is for the Minkowski and the other for this. We know that Minkowski is going to remain invariant because that's what Minkowski metric does, invariant under Lorentz transformation. So we essentially going to get that the new metric is going to be Minkowski, just written in the new coordinates, plus the uh, perturbation in the new coordinates which are just transformed by the Lorentz transformations. 
So this shows that in the weak field limit, the metric perturbation part also transforms like a tensor in a special relativity. That's a plus to simplify the calculation. And um, the idea is that all physical fields, including the Riemann tensor, will be written just in terms of this. Another important thing is still coordinates, more about coordinates. So what I call gauge transformation, but it's essentially how we choose coordinates. Um, so one way of choosing coordinates, they're going to leave this condition that was very important, that H alpha uh, beta is smaller than one, no matter how many, in how many different coordinates we end up writing this, could be like this. So we move from coordinates X alpha to coordinates X alpha prime, adding a vector that is only a function of uh, some function of the old coordinates. If this new vector is small, essentially we're going to have it like this, obey this uh, condition, then the transformations are going to be uh, like this and can be written to first order like this because otherwise it's going to be second order in this and we already assume this to be small. So this is important to give us uh, good choices of coordinates. So to first order then, if we, we go um, to new coordinates that are uh, related to the other ones through this particular simple formula, we're going to have this. And theta alpha essentially goes up and down with the Minkowski method. So we don't have the general metric messing up our calculations. And uh, essentially, the perturbation then is going to change like this. So because we assume this quantity to be small, then the new uh, metric in the new coordinate is going to be small. But things like this are, are what I call a gauge transformation. And um, it's, it's, it's an intrinsic freedom of Einstein theory of relativity that you can move from coordinates to coordinates to coordinates and things don't change. But uh, to, to be sure that that's the case, uh, you need to keep uh, things under control. And this is a way of keeping things under control. The interesting thing of all this is now if we calculate the Riemann tensor, which is a monster quantity, 256 components in, in four dimensions, the calculation are going to yield just this. So notice how simple it is because all the other parts are Minkowski. So, uh, you know, proving this is, is, is a bit of calculation and it's rather easy. So the Riemann tensor can be written in terms of this and, of course, Minkowski metric doesn't get into. So Riemann tensor does not depend on these small quantities because they're second order. And that means that the first order, we don't need to consider them. So now from this, we can move on into getting the weak field equation. So we define with an index up, it's going to go with a Minkowski. And if I need to raise this index, it's going to be written also with a Minkowski metric. One interesting thing is that this guy is going to have the trace being like this. And uh, we can now do something called the trace reverse of this by doing this calculation. And the trace of this new guy, which is the trace reverse of the old uh, metric perturbation, is going to be given by this, which eventually is equal to minus h, which is the trace. The inverse uh, or the original equation is going to be the same, and what we get is this. With this, the Einstein tensor is going to become one half h bar. Well, all this quantity you see here up to second order. Um, this is still a simple result, and uh, 
Now, with this simple result, we're going to make it even simpler. And the idea is to require this, that this divergence of this uh, h bar is zero. Using the definition that h bar has, essentially what we're requiring is this. And we're going to need to choo choose coordinates where these equations actually are 89 and, and 90, no, 90 and will be satisfied. <coughs> so this equation is called the Lorentz case. And if we assume that h bar um, uh, does not behave like this, so we then look for a new one. The new one, we're going to write it like this, using uh, the freedom of the information. The divergence of the new is going to be written like this. And all we're going to need, essentially, is to have the box operator, which is the standard Laplacian operator times the second time derivative uh, with a minus sign in front. It's going to have to behave like this. So uh, this is a requirement that we need to have. So the inhomogeneous for this equation, or we have a solution. And, uh, you know, if we find uh, a well-behaved for the inhomogeneous part. And this solution always going to be defined as a function that has the uh, box operator equal to zero, all of less than four dimensions in one. And um, so what we have defined here is what is called a class of gauges. But essentially, in this particular gauge, Einstein tensor can be written like this. It's just the box operator of the perturbation that has now been transform over uh, the choice of different coordinates. And the weak field Einstein equations then are going to be the box operator times, sorry, not times, equal to um, the energy matter content of space-time. These are called the field equations in the linearized theory. Notice that the metric part has no relationship to the matter content because that's always a solution of uh, of vacuum, and uh, and once we have something that is different from vacuum, then we depart from uh, Minkowski. So, in vacuum, the equations are just box of h uh, alpha beta. The bar, remember, stands because we departed from. Uh, hypothetical candidate and then uh, ended up by picking up different coordinates uh, getting this equation. Uh, if we assume that there is a time dependence, because if, if there's no time dependence, then this, the second time derivative in this box is going to generate nothing, and we have just a standard uh, three-dimensional Laplacian. But if there is a time dependence, this is the wave equation. In other words, wave a solution of Einstein's equations in the weak field limit. So, Einstein realized that this was a possibility just one year after uh, developing the, the field equation, which happened in 1915, something that took you know, a good 10 years for him to he was working on and off, but took 10 years for him to develop this in a theory. But just one year after the theory, he was able to, to see that, that there, was, there were way solutions in, for his equations in this limit. It was hard for him to see what was the effect of this. And he tried several times and, and actually didn't choose the right coordinates. So this story, probably boring and tedious story about picking coordinates, was were crucial, and uh, actually several people helped uh, Einstein in, in, in picking uh, the right coordinates to understand in the intrinsic meaning of these gravitational waves that could be a solution of Einstein. So, there's a long way from seeing this and understanding what is the effect and what are the sources. So, all this is showing that, in principle, mathematically, waves could be a solution of Einstein's equation. So, now, let's go to the Newtonian limit of this. In the Newtonian case, 
Remember, we expect uh, the, 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 the scalar fields to be smaller than one. Uh, uh, the, the velocities in magnitude will be much smaller than the speed of light. And, and this uh, essentially means put constraints on the different components of the energy momentum tensor, which essentially means that the, the most important uh, uh, equation here will be this, where this is the, the energy density of the space time. So if we work in what is called the slow motion approximation, then we're going to assume that for any function f, we can write it like this, where this guarantees uh, you know, the order at which we are working. Essentially, we uh, over c times the uh, any derivative uh, of the this of any function is going to be proportional just to the time derivative. In this limit, of course, the zero zero uh, component of the energy momentum test is just the energy density. Everything is going to be of the order of v squared, and which is a small quantity. And then we can write the box operation like this. Our equation to the lowest order is going to be written like this. And if we can compare with Newton's equation, then we see that this is what we obtain, uh, where we put just g equal to 1, because we're working in those units, g equal 1, c equal 1. So <coughs> we need to identify uh, h0, 0 with minus 4, 5. And we consider all the other components to be uh, small. And essentially, this is what we get that h0 is minus 2 pi. And we recover this uh, formula that I introduced at, at the beginning um, for a metric in uh, a weak field limit. So now, what are the requirements that we want to have in the weak field limit? So. We have to be far from the source. Um, we want to be sure that uh, the metric that we are looking at is a solution of the vacuum Einstein field equations. Uh, the, the, the essentially, the space time has to become Minkowski. And uh, the metric, we said that we're going to take it like that. And with this, requirements on H, uh, then all this is going to become true. So let's say that we have our the traditional distance, Cartesian distance. All this means is that H alpha beta has to fulfill this requirement, that when the distance goes to infinity, this quantity has to be order of 1 over R. The derivative has to be order of 1 over r squared, and the second derivative has to be order of r cubed. And uh, so to identify, well, this 31 has nothing to do because it's, it's you know, the, that number is lost here. But um, Schutz discusses in his book all the conditions that are needed, but I in summary, what we need to look at is far from the field, the potential has to be of the type minus m over r plus order of r squared. And we can essentially then redefine the, the phi potential and put it in, in, in these terms. And uh, I mentioned that I wanted to cover the wild tensor because uh, although I think at some point I might say something when I discuss the sources. And um, I just want to introduce it here. <coughs> so the white tensor is, is a tensor associated with the Riemann tensor that provides some very useful information, particularly in the case of gravitational radiation. So uh, in four dimensions, the Riemann tensor has 20 independent components out of the 256. And 10 actually are, are given by RAB, but the other 10 are actually given by the wild tensor. That's the reason why it's useful uh, to 
to construct these quantities. So this is the definition of the wild tensor in, 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 in any number of dimensions. Of course, we're interested when n is four. And um, so in four dimensions, of course, it's gonna be this. So notice how we construct it with the Ricci tensor, with this Riemann tensor, and with the metric. So it has the same symmetry that the Riemann tensor has, but it has one additional symmetry when you add a sum. This is a sum indicated here on the index A. So Z0, zero, B0D zero plus C1, B1, D plus so on and so forth. That's the trace of the wild tensor. So wild tensor is trace-free, and, and that's um, something that becomes very useful. After this, I want to discuss now gravitational waves. But before going to that, to make the class of today not too boring, I wanted to talk a little bit using material from an old talk that I gave almost 10 years ago at the Hanford Observatory where you, know, you have a whole bunch of people all working on this, and they were very interested in, in, in looking at the history of uh, gravitational wave detection. And um, so I'm gonna say a few things now because I think they're relevant and interesting. Um, these are the main references that I use throughout this uh, slide. The book by Abraham Pace doesn't have much about gravitational waves, but um, but it has a lot about Einstein's thought. Uh, Harry Collins now had two more uh, books, uh, but, uh, but they're, they're, they're very enlightening, particularly the discussion about where, uh, why Weber failed uh, with, the, with discovering gravitational waves. What were the main mistakes in his technique? And, um, a very lovely book is uh, Daniel Canepec, Traveling the Speed of Thought, Einstein, The Quest for Gravitational Waves. Um, this, this is it's fun to read. And um, then there are two very uh, recent brief articles. Um, they, they're probably already published. Uh, this one, I think, is in a Chinese journal, but you can find in the archive uh, with this number. It's a brief history of gravitational wave research. I learned a few things here. And there's another paper write, uh, written by this guy. By the way, G. Smooth is the Nobel Prize, so the, the Smooth from the Kobe Project. Uh, every history of gravitational waves is also a quite interesting paper uh, to read. So one of the things that I learned that actually there are people before Einstein that started thinking in terms of gravitational waves. And I personally found that fascinating. The guy was William Kingdom Clifford. Uh, the, the guy famous for the Clifford algebras. I don't know if you ever got into the arcane topics of mathematics or twister theory or you know, things like that. But he's a very famous mathematician, died very young. And by the way, his tomb is very close to Karl Marx's tomb in, in, in London uh, Cemetery. And he said in 1876, it was, his paper was published in the Proceedings of the Cam Cambridge Philosophical Society. Smooth portion of the space are in fact of a nature analogous to little hills on the surface, which is on average flat. Namely, that the ordinary laws of geometry are not valid for them. That the property of being curved or distorted is continually being passed on from one portion of the space to another after the manner of the wave. I, 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 I find fascinating you were thinking in those terms. So we're thinking about the physical interactions in nature and how you are bound to require wave theories to explain them. And uh, he died very young and uh, he, he never worked uh, on, on gravity or anything like that beyond this. Uh, the first time, at least that can be found in, in the literature that um, that the term gravitational wave was used, it was in 1905. Uh, Poincaré uh, used the term actually in French, 
uh, discussing the extension of Lorentz invariance to gravitation. And um, 1900 Lorentz conjecture gravitation can be attributed to actions we can see now propagate faster than light. But actually, it goes before that. In, in the 19th century, uh, the, the, the United Kingdom Crown instituted a prize. Uh, I think it was in the 18th century, actually, in the 19th century. For people that were trying to explain the motions of the moon in a precise manner, it was when they are this, for navigation, they wanted to uh, be able to determine uh, uh, clearly uh, longitude, and longitude was quite a challenge to be determined because uh, you couldn't take uh, instruments on ships when you were moving that would give you accurate reading of the position. So observation of motion of the moon were important, but there were issues with uh, with uh, understanding exactly um, how to uh, forecast those positions. And there were attempts at looking at the trajectory of the moon uh, in used in terms of what nowadays you would call gravitational uh, back reactions, which are related to the idea that there is non-instantaneous communication between two bodies when it comes to the bound by gravity. That, that somehow there is a delay in the communication. So those actually are before Lawrence. But um, we already saw the, the weak field limit. In 1918, and I'm going to cover this tomorrow uh, a little bit, Einstein developed the formula uh, attributing the sources of gravitational radiation to uh, the acceleration of the quadrupolar distribution of matter. And again, I'm not going to talk now about that because I'm planning to talk tomorrow. But there was a big problem. And um, because the theory was highly nonlinear, um, it, was, it wasn't clear. It, it, if you look at the exact solutions of Einstein equations, I don't remember now the number. There's this very thick book. And the people probably still doing some research into exact equations of Einstein field equations uh, with many different types of solutions. And also, when some people find one that appears to be a new one, it actually is a different one with just different coordinates. And but this there's, there's a good classification of book by um, uh, Kramer and. Stephanie and uh, McCallum and some other German guys that was originally written in the 80s or 70s. And there's, uh, I think, another second edition. If you go through that book, you're going to see there's so many, many, many different uh, exact solutions. 99% um, of them have no physical value. They're very interesting mathematically in characterizing the theory. But uh, if you go beyond Schwarzschild, Carnewman, and Freeman Roberts of Walker, all the other solutions had only limited value in understanding the nature of theory. So can you imagine uh, 100 years ago when the theory was just developed, uh, the fact that gravitational waves, so gravitational waves were a solution of the Einstein's equations uh, didn't have a very clear uh, meaning. And uh, Einstein himself and many of the people were doubtful that there was any physical reality uh, uh, behind this. Uh, and you can blame them because there was no astrophysical, uh, at least the, the state of astrophysics at that time was in its infancy. So in my mind, besides high energy physics, the other field that I, I experienced a tremendous development throughout the 20th century and this century is astrophysics. So there was a lot of skepticism uh, regarding the physical uh, uh, reality of gravitational radiation. And like I say, there were no astrophysical phenomena that clearly were emitting gravitational waves. And um, so in 1936, Einstein sent a letter uh, to Max Born. He says, together with the young collaborator, I arrived at the interesting result that gravitational waves do not see. Though they have been assumed a certainty to the first approximation. 
This shows that the nonlinear general relativistic field equation can tell us more, or rather limit us more than we have believed up to now. Look at this, Einstein, 1933. Now, just January 1937, this paper appeared in this not very well-known journal. I don't even know if it's been published, Journal of the Franklin Institute. And um, <coughs> so, if you look here, this is Einstein's equations, and, and here you're not going to be able to see from there, but this is a formula where the metric is written as Minkowski plus the perturbation. So, um, this particular solution of the weak field limit is nowadays called Einstein Rosen. Now, why in 1936 he said that he was doubtful of the existence of gravitational waves, and then 1937 he published a paper showing a particular solution of uh, the weak field limit that represented cylindrical waves. So, it's like uh, cylinders that were moving away from uh, an axial source. Well, only in 2005 we learned the truth. It turns out that that paper that appeared in the Journal of the Franklin Institute, Einstein uh, submitted it to the Physical Review. And the Physical Review actually sent it to a referee that said that there were inconsistencies in the paper were wrong. And actually that paper was saying that gravitational waves did not exist. And uh, Percy Robertson was uh, Einstein's next neighbor at Princeton. So although Einstein never knew that Robertson was the referee for his paper, they got the chance to talk. He learned the mistakes he made correct the paper. Interesting part is, Einstein got mad at the physical review because uh, in Germany, uh, there wasn't the, this, this idea of, of peer review was not existing. So it's, it's somehow it was taken in the United States and, and then eventually spread to, to all the scientific world. So he got mad that he already had a Nobel Prize, how someone dared to pin one of his papers to somebody else to see if it was fine. And so he never published again a paper in the physical review. And he sent it to that not very known uh, journal where it was published, but thanks to Robertson. So this is, this is a log of the physical review. Look at the year 1936. And um, here is Einstein Rosen, where you can read from there. Here you can see the referee was Robertson. So, um, the part that is not that well known, that actually that same solution had been published in 1925 by Germany's non-existence on Seichrich 56, was a well-known German journal. 1926, 11 years before Einstein, exactly the same solution. Guido Beck published the solution. What is interesting about Guido Beck is that uh, he was an Austrian physicist, actually quite, quite a career. I mean, he, he was a leader of Ukrainian physicists. So because of uh, his Jewish origin, he went to Odessa in Ukraine. So he worked in the Soviet Union for some time. Then he went back to France. In France, he was imprisoned by the Nazis. And he escaped to Portugal, eventually immigrated to Argentina in 1943. He's actually uh, the founder of the institute where I study. And he also founded the Argentine Physics Association, which was the first one in Latin America. 1951, he moved to Brazil. 1970, then he went back to Argentina for a few years. In 1975, when came back to Brazil, to Rio, to the Centro Brasileiro de Pesquisa Físicas, he died in 1988 in a car accident in Rio de Janeiro. And um, so I, I thought it was most worth mentioning this here because um, his, uh, the, the history of the Central Brasileiro de Pesquisa Physicas in particular is impressive. Richard Feynman visited it, uh, Oppenheimer visited it, and, and you have people of uh, 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 Tiomno, uh, 
who work in, in general relativity for a long time. So there's a long tradition of general relativity in Brazil and in South America and Argentina. And um, it's, it's partly to the time that Mario Schoenberg uh, was working in Sao Paulo. And uh, so the next chapter in the saga, uh, in 1955, there was a conference in Bern. Nowadays, this conference is called the first meeting of general relativity and gravitation. I think the number 22 is going to be, uh, it's going to take place in Valencia, Spain, uh, next month. And, um, but this was the first one. It was actually um, in honor of the 50th anniversary of special relativity. There were very few people. I mean, there were just 40, 50 people working in the field. For a lot of these people, it was a bit of a mathematical game. This is taken from Kenefic book. Actually, Kenefic make, uh, he called it a family tree relating the people that were working in general relativity at that time. And you can see some names like uh, John Wheeler, uh, Peter Bergman, Herman Bondi, that was uh, very important, Nathan Rosen, that were eventually, uh, the Einstein Rosen, went to Israel and other people. Guido Beck was uh, here, was people that work in um, South America. And uh, so Einstein, Infel, and Hoffman did something very important around 1938, which uh, was understanding uh, how the motion of particle was determined by the field equations. That was important to understand uh, um, the sources of gravity. One of the biggest problems in general relativity is that when, when you do uh, classical mechanics in, you know, around the middle of your career uh, as an undergraduate physicist, uh, one, at least for me, it was one of the most beautiful things I learned uh, as an undergraduate student in physics is to solve the Lagrangians for two bodies in Newtonian mechanics and get these beautiful uh, orbits and polar coordinates. And uh, that's a two-body problem. It has a precise, exact solution in the mechanics. The two-body problem does not have an analytical solution in general relativity, period. And, and that makes a lot of the analysis trying to understand sources of gravity very, very difficult. So one possible treatment is having uh, bodies that are moving slowly calculate GR corrections and express the solution in power series of um, slow velocities over the speed of light and, and, and GM over R. Um, so this is what is called the Poisson tuning expansion. It's beyond the scope of this, but it's extremely important because actually uh, if, if I had time, I, I, I tried to explain a little bit about the process of a ring down. When you have two bodies, and we're going to see that they lose uh, energy, potential, gravitational potential energy, because they're emitting gravitational waves. As they start going closer and closer together, this is a process that takes hundreds of millions of years. So it's almost quasi stable for a long time. And post Newtonian expansion can give us. Uh, a good description of the physics at that stage. But after a binary system, which are the holy grail of detection of gravitational waves, um, go through their last innermost stable circular orbit, and the plunge happens, this Newtonian expansion doesn't converge anymore, and you need to um, use full numerical relativity. That was a big, big problem because numerical relativity didn't manage to solve the problem until 2004. 2004 is when you get it for the first time, full numerical relativity that didn't crash, um, showing the collision of two objects. It was very, very simple with a lot of um, um, probably simplistic assumptions, like no spins with the black holes, but um, this intermediate stage of the merger was hard to get, and nobody knew exactly what happened. And, and then eventually, 
after you get an object that is settling down, you can use what is called um, perturbation uh, theory um, to uh, study what is called the ring down stage of the merger. So this, this was completed at around that time. And what is interesting, it, part of the history of, of general relativity is that for from the 1950s through the 1970s, so at, at the, uh, for about 15 years, good 15 years, a lot of the research in general relativity was performed, funded by the Department of Defense in the United States. In particular, there was uh, the United States Air Force uh, Scientific Lab, the Patterson Lab, where a place where some people doing general relativity was working, at the right Patterson, there was actually a relativity group there. And what is interesting, the reason why they were funding it, because they were hoping that people doing general relativity could find anti-gravity. Uh, the reason why I put this, because this is a nice m movie with George Clooney that is called Men Staring at Ghosts. And although it's, 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 it's a humorous take, uh, it's true. There was a lot of new age inspiration in the Army in, in the 50s and 60s uh, that let them fund parapsychology, that's, that's where they're funding here, and anti-gravity. But this helped to keep uh, gravity alive in those years. And um, so doing a recap of this year's 1936, we have Einstein-Rosen, um, einstein infeld hoffmann uh, first position of in an order. In 1941, Landau Lipsy claimed the quadrupole formula applies to gravitation away from binary stars. 1955, Rosen argues that gravitation away cannot carry energy, so it's like a step back. 1957, Bondi presents thought experiments that show that gravitational waves actually do carry energy. And um, regarding this point, there are still some scientists that argue about this point even after gravitational waves have been detected. Uh, 1962, Bondi developed a very interesting helpful formalism showing the system that were emitting gravitational waves were losing mass. And uh, there was a very uh, useful book in the 60s, published in Infel and Levansky. In 1965, Smith and Havas, using fast motion calculations, find that actually Binary system gain energy, so the calculations, of course, were wrong. 1970, Chan Brasekan is possible to recover the quadrupole formula for a binary star system. Um, 1979, Rosen argues that binary stars do not lose energy again, going backward. So the interesting point about this, and I want to uh, look at, at this particular quote. Feynman, after attending a GR conference in Warsaw in 1962, he said in a letter to his wife, I'm not getting anything out of the meeting. I am learning nothing because there are no experiments. This field is not an active one. So few of the best men are doing work in it. The result is there are hosts of dopes here and it's not good for my blood pressure. Remind me not to come to any more gravity conferences. And um, in some sense, Feynman was right. By the way, some people call this times of, of in the history of general relativity, um, what was the way it was called by some historian of science? Um, the low mark, the low water mark of general relativity. And um, an experiment was needed. An experiment would set at all these discussions. So tomorrow when I go into um, showing actually what are the characteristics of gravitational waves that come out of the weak field limit, I'll, I'll try to go into this. And, and look at, uh, at the sources and start discussing the sources, which I'm planning to do between today and tomorrow. The last day of my talk, actually I wanted to talk about my research, which is not really much about general relativity, but it's about the electromagnetic follow-up of sources. But I thought that it could be interesting because it gave me the chance to talk about one of the probably most magnificent, interesting sources that we detected, which is the kilonova associated with uh, gravitational wave 17, 0817, uh, that was 
really a fantastic event in the history of fishing. So I, I want to touch in upon that on my last lesson. And a few minutes early, but I think uh, I'm tired. You're probably more tired than me. So we can finish tonight.